This video guide is going to show you how to conduct an independent samples t-test in SPSS as well as that will show you how to write it up and produce a Cohen's day effect size for it as well. So the independent variable in this experiment is just simply called group and what that refers to is whether our participants received a placebo drink, so a drink that looked and tasted and smelt like alcohol but contained no alcoholic content or they're in an alcohol prime condition in which they actually did consume an alcoholic drink. So this is delivered on a between subjects basis, so they either receive the placebo drink or they receive the alcohol prime, no one receives both drinks. And then the dependent variable in this is reaction time on the street test. The reaction time is just measured in milliseconds. And the street test, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, is when you have the names of colours presented in different coloured ink. So for example, as you can see here, we've got the word red presented in green ink and the word blue presented in yellow ink. And what participants have to do is they have to state the colour in which the word is printed. In this example, they'd have to state green, yellow, and we take this measure several times, so maybe a hundred trials, and then we take their average reaction time on this. Longer reaction times are indicative of the participants struggling more to do this. So we expect the participants in our alcohol prime condition, so group one, will have generally longer reaction times than those in our placebo condition because alcohol will interfere with the ability to suppress the reading of the word and actually state the colour as it impacts executive functioning. So in order to analyse this data, it's a relatively straightforward task. We go to analyse, compare means, independent samples t-test, and this gives us our independent samples window. So you can see we've got test variables and we've got a grouping variable. You can run multiple t-tests at once. In this, but we're only going to look at one at the moment. So our test variable is our dependent measure, which is Stroop reaction times. So we put that in there. And then our grouping variables, so this is our independent variable. And you can see when I click it across, it puts two question marks in. Because this is where you have to define the two groups. That's a really straightforward when you've got the variable labels as it is in this, because we've only got two groups. And you can as you can see here, the labels are zero or one. So we state zero and one in there. And then click continue. And now you can see within the brackets it's got the coding of the variable now appears. And that's essentially all you have to do. Once you've done that, you can click OK. And this gives you your independent samples t-test output. So we've got two tables here. First thing it does, it gives you a table descriptive statistics. So it breaks down the Stroop reaction time score for each group, placebo and alcohol prime group. And there's 30 people in each. That's the mean and the standard deviation, as well as the standard error for that group. And then you can see same statistics again appear for the alcohol prime group. First thing we've got here is Levine's test for equality of variances. This tests one of the assumptions that we have equality of variances. Now for Levine's test, you want Levine's test to be non-significant. This would indicate that you have equality of error variances. And so because in this example, as you can see, we have equality of error variances, we look at equal variances assumed, we look at this line of the data, we don't look at equal variances not assumed. I will come on to describe that a little bit later on. So we can look at our output here and what we can see is, is we've got our t-statistic which is minus 3.044, our degrees of freedom which is simply total number of participants minus 2, so 58 and our p-value here of 0 0.004 and then we've got a mean difference, standard error of the mean difference and confidence intervals for the mean difference. When we report it, we report the t-statistic, the degrees of freedom and the p-value that is produced here. So we'd write, to write this up, we'd write something like participants in the alcohol condition had significantly greater reaction time compared to the placebo condition and we'd report T, and then in brackets 58. We'd report the T statistic then to two decimal places, 3.04, and the P value, P equals 0 
You'll note when I've done this, I haven't included the minus. The minus isn't that particularly relevant because all the t tests are doing are the two groups different from each other, and the t statistic is what's used to derive the p value for it. Now, because my sentence clearly states the participants in the alcohol condition had significantly greater reaction times compared to the placebo condition, and I'd also give a table descriptive statistics in which we could see what causes this difference, the, the sort of minus isn't, isn't that relevant. It's not like a correlation coefficient where there's a positive association and a negative association means something very, very different. The T statistic is just saying there is, it's just describing the magnitude of the difference between the two groups. So if I need, in a sentence, state the direction, it doesn't matter if it's a positive or negative. Indeed, if I just labeled these conditions the other way around, so if I called the alcohol prime zero in the placebo group one, and then reran this analysis, that would simply become a positive. It would, but it's exactly the same data. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever to any conclusion you make, because you look at your descriptives and you see that the alcohol prime condition has greater reaction time scores than the placebo condition. The other thing that we can do is we should always give an effect size probability. You, know, you can only go so far with probability. It's, you shouldn't base every inference simply on that because it doesn't, this doesn't tell you anything about the magnitude of this difference. So how different are these two means? You can do this in lots of different ways. First of all, you can just go online um, and look up a Cohen's D calculator for an independent samples t-test. So usually on these, you'll just put in your means and standard deviations for each group and your sample size for each group, and it'll calculate it for you. You can also do this calculation by hand. It's not a particularly tough calculation to do. It's a little bit more complicated than some though. So what we could, what you do is you just simply will plug in the data here. So in this case, where you can be N is just simply substituted with 30, and the T is simply substituted with the T statistic from your independent samples T test, and you'd follow the computational procedure like this, and eventually that will compute you your Cohen's D, and you'd add that Cohen's D at the end like this. If you want to interpret Cohen's D, there's sort of rough thresholds that we say a Cohen's D of 0.2 is a small effect size, a Cohen's D of 0.5 is medium, and a Cohen's D of 0.8 is large. Another point as well, if you've got a minus t statistic and you include these things in your calculation, you may get a minus Cohen's d. Just like the minus for the t, it's completely irrelevant because you're just talking about the magnitude of the difference. I'd never put a minus in front of a Cohen's d either. One other thing that's worth pointing out that I mentioned earlier on is, well, what do you do if this is statistically significant? So what would you do if you don't meet the assumption of equality of error variances? Well, you can use this line. Because we have a quality of error variances, this line is identical, so um, it doesn't make much sense to report this really. However, if you were to find this is significant, what you could do is look at this line. And what actually this line is, is a Welch test. And the Welch test is specifically designed for when you don't have a quality of error variances. And you could report the, the Welch test instead. There's actually a very good blog about this um, by Daniel Lakins that's worth looking up and why you should he makes the recommendation that you should always actually report the Welch test because a Welch test when you have a quality of variances as you can see is equivalent to a standard independent samples t-test however it is superior when you don't have a quality of error variance so he makes the case that why wouldn't you just report Welch's test because it can it can never be worse than an independent samples t-test it can only ever be better I'll add the link of that into the description of this video for anybody who is interested.